Um, my name's Carrie Kovarek. You have a very large write-up about me on, in front of you if you want more information about me. Um, I'm a dermatologist. I'm in the School of Medicine. My specialty is in telemedicine, and more um, recently I've been doing more work in mobile tele... Can you guys hear me? In mobile telemedicine, using cellular phones to provide specialty care in resource-limited settings. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, Ryan Littman Quinn, who just uh, stepped out for a minute, is my director of uh, mobile telemedicine in Botswana. He's actually here for the day, and then we're going to the telemedicine meeting. So he's in, in from Botswana right now um, and has really been my partner in scaling this up in Botswana. So he'll be back if you have any questions for him as well. Um, we have several people in the room that I've been working with in Botswana in telemedicine and informatics, and thank you all for coming. And so today I'm going to talk about telemedicine in general. Um, I'm going to tell you what I've been doing with uh, telemedicine using internet-based systems, and then I'm going to move into the mobile-based systems. We started using the internet-based systems, and so that's what I'm going to talk about first. That was kind of our platform for getting started. And then I'll transition into mHealth, or mobile telemedicine, and explain why we have gone from internet or computer-based systems into mobile or cellular phone-based systems and the rationale for that. And if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please let me know that we have time for questions and it can be as interactive as you want. So telemedicine in the developing world. So we have a, a mixed audience here, so I'm going to be very basic and not try to be too uh, medical in, these, in the discussion. In general, in the developing world, access to specialty care is a problem. So patients may be able to get to a nurse or a primary care provider in their local area, but it might be very difficult to get specialty care. So, um, for example, dermatology. I'm a dermatologist, and there may be only one or two dermatologists in a country. Um, for example, in Botswana, there's only one dermatologist in the public sector in the entire country. She's in the capital city. And so obviously, if you don't live close to the capital city, it's difficult to get expert dermatology care without traveling there, which is a, a big inconvenience. And the new field of mobile telemedicine, so using cellular phones to provide telemedicine, um, is a newer field and is takes you away from being tied to that physical computer or internet connection and allows you to send consults using phones. So we started off providing teledermatology through an internet-based application. And dermatology was where I started because I'm a dermatologist. And here's our website. We realized that in the HIV epidemic in Africa, there was a lot of skin disease. And Really, it's one of the specialties that's most needed in areas of HIV epidemics because um, a lot of the, the findings that people get from HIV are on the skin or in the mouth. And so the doctors that see these need to be able to recognize these problems. However, in a lot of the training um, programs, like in the US, if you're trained to be a medicine doctor or a pediatrician, you don't get a lot of dermatology training. And so there's great doctors that are trying to help the HIV patients, but just not with a lot of expertise in skin conditions. And so teledermatology was really helpful. And this was also the case for training programs in Africa. So pe people that had been trained in, in pediatrics in Africa may not have ever gotten any dermatology, yet they have these patients coming to see them in large numbers with skin complaints, and they just don't know what to do with them because there's no dermatologist. So we started this website. This is Stephen Kadu. He's a dermatologist in Graz, Austria. He's originally from Uganda. <coughs> and we started this website together in 2007 with several partners. Um, our main partner was the Baylor International Pediatric AIDS Initiative, who started pediatric AIDS clinics throughout Africa. And this was a great place to start because we had those primary care pediatricians going to Africa with little dermatology um, training, seeing lots of skin diseases. So this internet um, application was very useful in that setting. Once we started with those Baylor clinics, which were in Malawi, Uganda, Lesotho, Swaziland, and Botswana, 
um, there was obviously a need outside of those clinics. So in the Ministry of Health clinics, in the smaller clinics, um, in the district hospitals. So moving away from the main city centers, there was also a need for this type of, of consult. So someone would come into the clinic, have a skin complaint, they would log on to this uh, application. It's a very easy application to use. They enter the clinical information, attach some photos, and send it. Then I get an email that there's a case for me to answer. I log on to the website. I put the answer, and then they get an email that there's an answer. And I physically went to all of those Baylor clinics, trained people in teledermatology, so how to take the photos appropriately. As you can imagine, some people um, don't think about what I'll be seeing on the other end. They could take a picture. So if he's the patient, he could stand over here and take a picture of him. I'm not going to be able to see his rash very well. And there's all this background, you know, and is it, we're not going to see the rash. So talking about how to set the patient up um, with a nice background, not have a lot of distractors in the background, make sure you focus on it, have good lighting, things like that. So we train the people to, to send consults. Um, and after that, it sort of spread by word of mouth. And you can see that we have a lot of partners that we work with. Um, we now have an iPhone app. And this is a more recent addition to this website um, once the smartphones really started to roll out in Africa. So here are the sites where we work now. We get uh, consults from all of these countries um, throughout Africa because it's the only um, website that's free where people can send cases to get expert uh, opinions in dermatology in Africa right now. And in fact, we just were featured in a WHO article that said we're one of the longest running um, humanitarian telemedicine websites. So a lot of these websites will kind of come and go because it's an easy way for um, consults to be sent. Just set up an easy website, have people send the consults. But in order to keep this type of service going, you really have to continue to have a connection with the people that are sending you the cases. What often happens is someone will sell it, set up a telemedicine service. The people on the ground will get really excited. They'll send a couple cases, and then it'll sort of fizzle out. So it takes this continual engagement with the people that are going to be sending you the cases. And in Botswana, particularly, what that I'll talk about in a while, we've been successful there because we have permanent people on the ground working with the, the doctors. So back to this internet-based application. Since the beginning, we've had about 1,200 consults come through from 13 countries. We also realized that a lot of these cases, well, not a lot of them, probably about 10% of these cases, I couldn't answer with confidence without additional studies. So I couldn't look at the rash and say, I'm, I'm confident that it's eczema or some other con skin condition and give them recommendations. In some of those cases, I needed a biopsy or some additional study. And in some, a lot of these countries, it's really diff difficult to get a skin biopsy um, because they don't have labs for processing the tissue. They don't have the pathologist to look at the slides. And so we have a program that if a teledermatology case comes to me and I can't tell what it is and a biopsy would probably give us the answer and this, this person is sick, then we have the, them send us the wet tissue. And we have a program that we've set up so they can actually ship it through DHL from Africa. It gets to my office in about four days. And if it's fixed in formalin, it's deemed non-infectious by the CDC, and it can actually travel through the mail. And I'll show you some examples. So like I was telling you, we went to these countries. We did, yes? So... <laughs> That's a good question. Um, first of all, you'd be amazed at what some of these addresses are. The return address on some of these DHL envelopes is like corner of so-and-so next to the post office. I'm not kidding. It's like that's their address. Um, the good thing about DHL is it is everywhere in Africa. FedEx wouldn't have worked as well because it's just not as widespread. Um, but I have many providers that submit cases from very rural areas in, DH, uh, in, in Africa, Tanzania, Swaziland, and Lesotho, and there's DHL pickups in the middle of absolute nowhere. And the other nice thing about DHL was I was able to set up an account with them through DHL International, send the paperwork um, through email, like in a PDF file, to the people that are sending it to me. They just print it up, 
and give it to the DHL uh, counter and they'll ship it. So, yeah, that's what made it work. It's amazing. I, I've had about, this is, I said 60, but it's probably more like 80 or so specimens sent to me of the last three years, and we've only had one lost. And I, that's pretty amazing to me. So, so that program, we actually pay for it at Penn. That's the only program that Penn really funds. And it's $75 a specimen, um, and we, I'm a dermatopathologist, and so we process the slides for free. So the actual cash out of pocket has probably been about $5,000 over three years, and then them just processing the specimens for free. So um, The internet site is sponsored by the American Academy of Dermatology, as well as um, there's a medical institution in Austria who has been sponsoring it. Um, and that's where the money comes from to keep the website. So here's an example of a case that we've gotten um, on the telemedicine web, teledermatology website. This came from Uganda. This is actually a pretty classic case of cutaneous tuberculosis. Um, once you've seen it, you recognize it over and over. Um, this is about a 10-year-old child in rural Uganda. Um, the, is there a pointer? Oops, that's not it. No pointer? I don't think so. That's okay. Um, so if you look at the child's face, you can see the, the middle of the face is very scarred, and there's sort of a crusted area. This is the middle of the face. Um, the nose has been kind of scarred down. This is all scarred, and this is the active border, this crusty area. And as it continues to progress, it just expands further and further out, sort of destroying everything in its way. And in dermatology, there's these things that you see that once you see it, you recognize it over and over. Um, and so we received this case. We told them what it was. They started them on uh, TB treatment, and the child got better. And the nice thing was the next time they saw a case of this, they submitted it just to let us know that they knew what it was and that they had learned how to diagnose this, which was wonderful for us to see the progression of that because that's our goal, really, to to teach them dermatology. And in fact, the sites that submit a lot of cases, the cases get harder and harder because they know the easy stuff now and you feel less successful because they're asking you the harder cases. So this is an example of a case that I looked at. This is a little girl in Malawi. She's four years old. And she had this large tumor on her stomach. And when they sent me the case, I mean, all I could say was that looks like a malignant tumor. But I couldn't tell exactly what it was, which doesn't help us with prognosis or how to treat it. And so they sent us a piece of this tissue. Um, they do have, have the equipment to do biopsies there. This one, they had one of their surgeons do the biopsies. The problem with Malawi is they have one place to process tissue in the country. It's in the capital city, and things get lost on the way there. It takes three months for processing. Some people never get reports back on stuff they've submitted. So they sent it to us, and we made the diagnosis of this malignant um, smooth muscle tumor called a leiomyosarcoma. It was um, related to Epstein-Barr virus, which is a virus that can cause cancer. For example, it can cause these leiomyosarcomas, and this little girl was HIV infected. And so in a lot of HIV patients, they will get uh, virally related malignancies. Um, and so we were able to make this diagnosis, and she had surgery and actually did pretty well. So the next stage of this was telepathology. So instead of sending us the tissue, how about I look at the, the slide remotely from my office? So we actually set up a telepathology scope in Botswana, where my primary um, dermatology association is. Um, and this is at the National Lab in Botswana, and they can put a slide on the scope, and I can log on, and I see this screen here, and I can actually move the scope. This is the actual scope. Um, move the stage, change the objectives, um, focus in and out, take photos, and then I'll send the answer back to the pathologist and the clinicians there, and they'll get the answer. So this prevents you from having to send the tissue, but this telepathology microscope is about $60,000. And so it's not really feasible to put in every country. 
Um, so in each country, depending on the level of development, um, you'll have a different sort of solution. Um, in Malawi, where there's no way we would be able to feasibly get this set up and have it run reliably, we do the tissue through the mail right now. In Botswana, where we have a little bit more control, we have a good partnership with the, the lab there, we're able to do it this way. This is what it looks like. We set up these little, um, there's four little slots where you can put slides. So they'll just put the slides on the microscope, let me know what cases are there, the case numbers. I'll log on, read the slides. Sometimes they'll give me clinical pictures and um, we're able to do it that way. Here's an example. This is a patient who came into the main dermatology clinic. Um, remember I told you there's one dermatologist in the public sector. She was there. And um, they did a biopsy. And this is a picture that I actually took in my office here at Penn. And I could zoom in to 40X. And you can see all these little dots within this, this high power picture. That's, uh, those are fungal elements, little uh, fungus infection in this patient. It's called cryptococcus, which is an infection that patients with HIV get. So we were able to make that diagnosis and she was started on the proper treatment. Any questions about the internet-based um, Africa Telederm project? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So internet is not reliable down there. In fact, in Swaziland, the Baylor site has, still has dial-up internet. So it's just, we've, we've figured out how to shrink the pictures small enough to be able to send them that way, but then we lose resolution. And so um, after I talk about this section, I'm going to talk about the mobile telemedicine. So the reason we went to mobile or cellular phone-based telemedicine is because in the capital cities where we were working, the clinicians could sometimes get to reliable com computers and internet, but even in Botswana and Havarone, where it's a huge city center with great technology and movie theaters and Target-like stores, the clinicians still can't get to a reliable computer in the hospital. It's really unbelievable. Um, and they, they all have these great smartphones, which they get on the internet on their smartphones. Um, because the, the cellular network is so, so well developed. Um, it used to be just a few years ago that the cell phone um, infrastructure really only had 3G, really focused in Habarone and some edge around it in GPRS and the rest of it. But now edge is really reaching, edge is sort of the next thing after 3G, reaching most areas. And you can send photos through your phone. I could answer my emails on my BlackBerry in the middle of nowhere, Botswana, because the cell phone network is that good. Um, and so we've really started to move away from this type of program to the mobile phone-based telemedicine application. Um, but it's all about what people are most comfortable with. And so there's still people that prefer the internet-based applications just because maybe they do have access to reliable internet and they're happy with it. But there's a lot of people that are frustrated with what they have, and those are the ones that are really excited to have mobile phones. Um, and the nice thing about introducing mobile phone technology like this in Africa is the general population is so comfortable with mobile phones that they all accept this type of thing. So, so after we did the, oh yeah, go ahead. You mean using the internet when they submit it? When they sub sure. Yeah. Um, so for that program, it was, it's pretty quick because we have a small group of people answering the consults that are dedicated to the project, which is really what helps it be successful. But someone will submit a case to me. I'll get an email, and I think 95% of the cases are answered within 24 hours. Um, it's not real time, which would be nice because then the patients, you wouldn't lose patients to follow up, which is a, a big problem. Um, you know, they could go to all this trouble of submitting a case and then never see the patient again. And I could say, well, that patient has a life-threatening lymphoma and then they can't find them again. So, you know, real time is really best, but that's not really feasible. And so, 
Oh, that's okay. So the internet site that I just showed, they'll submit cases on the website. I'll get an email at 10 that there's a case on the internet site. I'll log on, submit my answer. They'll get an email that they have an answer and they'll log on. And the whole thing only takes about 24 hours. Okay. Yeah. And so um, it was very easy to just change the website to reach out to Latin American countries. So we also have a website that you can toggle between um, Spanish and Portuguese. And so this pretty much serves all of Latin America. We also have an iPhone app for this site. Um, this has been a little bit different of a, an uptake than the Africa sites because there are dermatologists in most Latin American countries, but they still have the problem of maldistribution of these physicians. So for example, in Peru, um, there's something like 250 dermatologists in the country, and 240 of them are in Lima. So it's still a big problem. Um, but what you'd really like to do is get those dermatologists in Lima to be the ones reliably answering the consults, which isn't always the case. We try to make sure, we try to make um, the system created so that the in-country people answer the cases, but in some countries we're either there, we can't find ones that are really dedicated to it or there just aren't any, it's difficult to do. So this works simil in a similar way. It's an internet-based um, telemedicine system. Uh, we did go to different sites to train people just like we did in Africa. This was in the Guerrero province of Mexico. Um, we had about 80 people come to learn how to do telemedicine. Um, teledermatology specifically. And the reason that we targeted this area was because there's a program already set up that telemedicine really piggybacked onto well. So there's a dermatologist in Acapulco, which is the capital of the Guerrero state, who would go monthly to underserved areas within his state. Um, on Friday, he would do a didactic session of, teledermat of dermatology. And then on Saturday, they would do a hands-on session in a clinic showing the people that were in the didactics how to diagnose and treat skin disease. But when he left, there wasn't really any follow-up. And so teledermatology was a way to allow those people that he did that weekend course with to continue to send him cases and learn about what he had taught them. Um, and so when there's one person like that that's dedicated to teaching dermatology, teledermatology or telemedicine can definitely be useful. So in this training session, they actually um, brought in a patient. So this was a patient that we had answered the consult on and had come to a successful diagnosis and treated him, and he had gotten better. Uh, the woman standing in the picture is Dr. Dudon, who is actually a pediatric dermatologist in uh, Mexico City. The case had ultimately gone to her, and she had rendered the diagnosis. And remarkably, she had described the, this uh, syndrome. You can see uh, up top is the, the the um, journal article that she had written about this, this um, problem that the child had, told them how to treat it, and he had gotten better. So he, there he is, standing on the stage with no more skin lesions, and in the background, pictures of him with skin lesions. Um, and he, did, he, he was a little shy and did very well for what they had asked him to do, but they were so excited to demonstrate the fact that this can work and help the, the patient in the end that it was a, it was a really interesting example. Here, of course, in the U.S., um, you know, we have all these privacy laws and things like that, and it would probably be hard to get a patient to come and stand in front of 80 people with no shirt on and say, my, my skin's gotten better, but um, it all worked out. <clears throat> so now I'm going to talk about transitioning to M Health, and Ryan came back in. I told him about you. <laughs> Ryan's really been the hands and feet on the ground in Botswana to make all of this happen, um, and we've sort of been a team for the last three years doing this in Botswana, and it's really um, amazing how far we've come in that time, and it also testifies to the fact that it requires a physical presence in the place where you're doing this to really be successful. So in health, broadly it's uh, defined as using mobile devices for healthcare. That's just the general concept. There's many types of mHealth that I'll talk about in a second. And you can really use any capability on the phone for healthcare. So 
you've got GPS on your phone. You can track um, epidemics or outbreaks or where patients are, um, things like that. You can do SMS texting for appointment reminders, <coughs> image capture for telemedicine like we're doing with either photos or video. Um, all kinds of things can be done with phones for healthcare. And there's a lot of stakeholders in mHealth. So there's the patient who's ultimately benefiting from this. There's the doctor who also benefits because they have a way to get an answer for their patient. There's the governments like in Botswana who has a national healthcare system who now has a more efficient way to, to get specialty care to their patients and it's also money saving. And then other, um, many other groups that are stakeholders as well. And like we talked about a minute ago, we've sort of tried to implement computer and internet based technology in many of these countries and it ultimately has caused people to sort of leapfrog over it because it's really been not so successful and go to something like mobile phone based telemedicine or mobile phone based technology because that's really what's scaled up and useful in these countries. So these are all the types of mHealth applications. We really focus on diagnostic treatment and support, so telemedicine through using cell phones. But there's all kinds of mHealth applications out there that I just mentioned. So like I said, we focus mostly on mobile telemedicine, although we are branching out a little bit now. Um, but just to give you a, an idea of the workflow of how tele mobile telemedicine works, a patient will come in if they have say again, a, a rash that the clinician doesn't know what it is, the clinician will pull out the phone, open the application, enter the clinical information, take the photos, and submit the case. I'll get it, just like I did for the internet-based application, I'll get an email that there's a case, and I'll log on the internet. I could also log on to the phone to get the answer, but most of the time the experts are in a developed city and it's easier to get onto a computer. We have some people that log on to, to um, tablets as well because they have a bigger screen. Um, you can see the pictures and things like that just fine. So the expert will log on, look at the case, answer it, and the, the answer actually goes back to the phone. Um, it can come back through email or SMS, you, you know, that there's, there's a, they can have, get an SMS alert or an email alert. Um, and that's really the workflow. So it's eliminating the physical, internet connection and the computer completely and just relying on the mobile phone. And when we first started working in this space, um, we did a study in Botswana in 2009 which uh, looked at the, um, the acceptability of this technology by the patients. Um, we did a study in teledermatology. We had a nurse look at the rash um, that the patient had, do the whole process, and then they had a survey at the end that asked them what they thought of this process. Um, was it okay that we pulled out a bright pink cell phone and took pictures of their skin? Sometimes it was genital areas, the face. The patients were highly accepting of this technology. I think there was one person who said, I would prefer not to have a frontal facial shot taken. Um, just for privacy reasons, but otherwise uh, we had about 140 patients in this and, and they were all accepting, which tells us that culturally it's okay to do in Botswana, at least from that small sample size that we had. Um, we also did a concordance study. So in the, just three or four years ago, the American Telemedicine Association had a consensus statement that told you how to do telemedicine and teledermatology and explicitly stated that they didn't support or sort of encourage the use of cell phones for telemedicine. And the reason was privacy issues, the cameras weren't up to snuff, they weren't as good as you know, cameras that you could get otherwise. Just in the last three or four years, this has all changed. Um, there's HIPAA, which is the patient safety rules, HIPAA compliant um, medical applications on phones, the cameras are just as good as the cameras you're going to buy outside of a, a cell phone. And so they're going to actually revise the consensus statement saying that mobile phones are an acceptable way to do telemedicine now. But when we did this study in 2009, we, we needed to show that it worked. We needed to show that, yes, you can do telemedicine from a cell phone, and you're going to get the same type of, of response as if you did it through the Internet. And that's basically what we did. We did this in Egypt. Um, with the University of Cairo 
<clears throat> and we showed that the concordance, which is the diagnosis reached by the dermatologist with the patient in front of them, was um, very good compared to the diagnosis rendered by the person looking at the photos on the internet portal. Um, the concordance was about 75%, and in the internet, I mean, in the telemedicine literature, acceptable is between 70 and 90% typically. So now I'm going to transition to Botswana because this is really where we've been working in the mobile health space most recently <clears throat> and for the longest amount of time. This is Botswana. It's a landlocked country in Africa. It's, it's north, because I don't have a pointer, north of South Africa and borders on Zambia, Zimbabwe, and, and Namibia. It just started a University of Botswana Medical School in 2009. So this also provided us a great opportunity to engage the new, new medical students, the new residents in telemedicine, in mobile learning, which is education through cell phones. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, in addition, Botswana has the second highest prevalence of HIV, which helps us um, to appreciate the medical problems that they have in, in Botswana. So they have a lot of HIV-related illnesses, a lot of skin conditions again, a lot of, um, we talked about viral-related malignancies, so cervical cancer is a huge problem. Um, and that was really, that was really what motivated the botswana UPIM partnership to start there in, at first, but also for us to start mobile telemedicine there. So this is, there's an exhibit at the University of Penn Museum, the Archaeology Museum right now, called Imagine Africa. And it's talking about all things Africa. And they have a small exhibit on telemedicine there. And they actually put this uh, picture together. And we borrowed it for this presentation because we thought it really showed what people in Africa are up against in terms of patient-doctor proportion. So this is in the US. There's about five doctors for every 2,000 people. And in Botswana, it's five doctors to every 12,500 people. So that's just general doctors. But think about specialists. There's one dermatologist to two million people. That's ridiculous. That's just you're not going to get dermatologic care is the bottom line. And so uh, really telemedicine, whether it's to referring to people in country or using outside specialists, um, is one way to battle this problem. So we've talked about the mobile phone revolution, how the cell phone connectivity and infrastructure has really scaled up just within the last five years. There's turnover of phones. So at the top, you see this old cell phone cover that's on the ground. People have gone through old phones. They're on their you know, fifth, tenth, fifteenth phone. People are now getting smartphones. Um, you can refill your minutes at anywhere, anytime at the ends of the earth. This is a little phone shop. There's a lot of entrepreneurial work going on because people will set up shops to buy minutes, to sell. Um, some people will sell electricity. You know, you can charge your phone if you don't have a place to charge it. Or if you work somewhere with electricity, they'll just plug it in where they work. Um, but it's really interesting. The whole culture has changed around cell phones and that technology. So this is also a staggering statistic. Just in 2003, less than 10 years ago, 61% of the world was covered by a mobile signal. Three years later, 90%. It's really amazing that we're witnessing all of this in our lifetime. It's one of the the most um, scaled technologies that we can think of in the history and the fastest that this has happened. Um, you think about TVs or cars or other things like that. It didn't reach developing and really rural areas that fast in three years. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, So we've done it a few different ways. Um, we had one system that went through MMS, and now it goes through basically the internet. Yeah. Um, there's all kinds of reasons for doing it different ways. The reason to do it through the internet is the applications that are designed send them in that way. We had an MMS-based application. It had to be sent separately from the, the regular application. 
So this is also another statistic just, that just shows you how widely it's been scaled up. Pretty much everyone has a cell phone. You may not have sturdy walls on your house. You may live in a mud hut, but you have a cell phone. You may not have uh, minutes on your phone, but you've got the phone and people can call you on the phone. It's just amazing who has a phone. People that really don't make any money or farm, people that um, live in, in, in poverty have cell phones. So as we've scaled up this, this uh, program, we've started to partner with many uh, different people and groups. The Ministry of Health has been a primary partner for us. Because in Botswana, there's a national health care system. They're really the ones overseeing and providing the health care. And so it's very important to have them as a primary partner if you're going to enter the health care world and help them to provide health care. Excuse me, the University of Botswana has been a, a main partner because they're the ones now training the docs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Ryan, I'll let Ryan answer that because he's been there the whole time. And I think at first, they're a little bit hesitant to just welcome you in with open arms. And it's taken that presence, that continual presence over the course of a couple of years to really be sort of on the inner circle. You know, we were always kind of there, but not really as part of the decision makers or really getting policies to change. And now that's changing. Um, they're taking over the funding of this system that I'm going to describe. They're the ones that are taking the ownership, and that's always been our plan, was to set it up, you know, make sure that this is something that they want, and then transition it over to them. And then Orange has been our partner in the cell phone portion of it. They have provided us with data connectivity with some devices. Uh, Orange and MassCon are the main providers of cell service in the country. There's a few other smaller ones. And then Ping is a group that we've worked with uh, to help us with coding and in-country development. These are the specialties that we've focused in so far. And the main reason has been because these are visual specialties. So oral telemedicine, or sort of the, the medicine part of dentistry, uh, you can get rashes or blisters or tumors in your mouth just like you can on the skin. It's almost dermatology. We almost consider it a little bit of our domain, but we work with the, the dentists and the oral medicine specialists as well. But you can take photos of things in the mouth. Um, Ryan just sent me a little gadget that won a contest, a picture of a gadget that won a contest in mHealth that allows you to take um, photos in, and I guess capture images of the mouth in a better way, because it is a little tricky to take photos in the mouth. Um, cervical cancer screenings, you can photograph the cervix. It seems like it's a little more difficult. It's not just out there on the skin, but with a proper exam, you can take photos and do cervical cancer surveillance. Teledermatology, we've talked about, and then teleradiology. Dermatology and radiology have been the, the longest de developed telemedicine specialties, really, because they're so visual. So teleradiology, you can, sell, you can save a radiographic image easily on, on, the, on a computer and send it. That's telemedicine. Dermatology, you can take photos of skin rashes and send it. That's telemedicine. Um, things like 
I guess, telecardiology where it takes, you know, hearing a heartbeat or looking at an EKG, those kind of things are a little more difficult, but these visual specialties are the low-hanging fruit in telemedicine. And then we've also had programs where we've developed learning tools or educational tools, and we call those our access to medical resources uh, group. So there is also a problem with physicians or clinicians being able to access medical information in an efficient way. So not only do they have difficulty getting their patients in for specialty care, they sometimes can't even look up the, the information that they need to when the patient is there to help them take care of the patient. At the University of Botswana, the residents that are in training there go to sites where there may be no books, there may be no internet that works. And so really getting answers or help uh, in the medical literature or in books is just not there. And so we've been working with them to use mobile devices to help them with that. So back to access to specialists, we've talked about the workflow of how someone would send a case with a cell phone. And here's some examples. So the top picture is a patient with um, a cancer of the tongue. The bottom picture is a patient with something called Kaposi sarcoma, which is a tumor related to HIV. It's also related to a virus. So as I talked about before, if you have HIV, your immune system isn't as good as it should be. Viruses get in and can cause cancer, and this is one of those incidences. Oral medicine has really been the most successful project that we've had in telemedicine because of the dedication of the people on the ground. We have several dentists and oral medicine specialists who answer the cases in Habarone, and we've also trained and engaged many of the dentists in the district hospital. So the way the Botswana Health System is set up, you have three central hospitals, you have about 60 district hospitals, then you have clinics, and then you have health posts. So it's this um, pyramid-type setup. And so we're trying to engage clinicians at the district hospital level where they're just sending patients down to the central hospital with problems, but with no communication, really. They'll send them down there. They'll eventually get an appointment. They may get surgery. But if that clinician in the district hospital could talk to the specialist or send them a picture of the patient, things may flow a little bit smoother. Um, so for instance, the patient with the cancer, um, what could technically happen is this patient could just be, they could see the patient in the district hospital and they'd say, you need to go to Princess Marina in the capital for surgery. So the patient, you know, takes off work, gathers the family if they have to. They all go down to Habarone. They get into the clinic eventually. Um, surgery is set up for three weeks from now, so they have to hang around, and then they finally get surgery. But if they could send a picture of that patient and triage the patient to the, the oral surgeon, and, and he could say, yes, that's a cancer. We'll set him up for surgery in three weeks. The patient wouldn't even have to go down there until his surgery. So that's sort of the idea of making this more of an efficient process and helping communication between the clinicians in the district hospitals in the rural area and the consultants in the capital city. So cervical cancer screening, we did a study a couple years ago to show that the, the cell phone could be used for cervical cancer screening. So in developed, developing countries, they don't use pap smears as much for cervical cancer screening. Like we do in the US, every woman gets a pap smear, um, every year, every three, three years to, to screen for cervical cancer. In Botswana, they wanted to do pap smears, but they only have three pathologists, and they have 300,000 women that need to be screened. And those pathologists have to read all the pathology for every organ that's, that's biopsy, so that it's just not possible to read all of those pap smears. And so a couple years ago, there were statistics that showed 300,000 women needed pap smears, 10,000 women got pap smears. So that's the reality of it. And then in addition, being in a, in a population where there's so many HIV positive patients, the risk for cervical cancer is much, much higher, and there's really an urgent need for screening. And so uh, Doreen Ramahola Masseri is our in-country director of the Botswana UPIN partnership and is also a gynecologist and is starting this see and, treat met see and treat method of cervical cancer screening, where basically you do an exam uh, look at the cervix, put acetic acid or regular vinegar on the cervix, and it turns the cancer white. So if you look at the picture on the right, there's this whitish lesion on the cervix. That's actually cancer. The one on the left 
is a shiny normal cervix, and I'm not a gynecologist, but I can at least see the white thing on the cervix. <laughs> so um, the, the idea is nurses would be doing this screening, nurses that have been trained to look at the cervix once the acid has been applied and decide whether to treat it, which is with cryotherapy or freezing, or send them down to the capital city. Sometimes it's not so apparent whether the lesion needs to be treated. And so the cell phones can be used to take a photo of the cervix, send it to the gynecologist, and she can evaluate whether it needs to be treated or sent to her. So it allows them to have some kind of mentorship as well as ongoing training when they go out to these district hospitals and do this by themselves. So that's a way that Doreen, the one gynecologist around, doesn't have to go do pap smears on everybody. There's a system where nurses can be trained to do this, but yet have the cell phones to continue to connect them to her. And we actually did a study that showed that this could be used um, for this. Uh, we looked at the diagnosis um, by Doreen and by the nurses, and there was a very good concordance. It was about 83% between the two of them. Dermatology hasn't been scaled up as much, probably because the others have taken off much more, and we've sort of left this one um, to develop last. The other problem was we didn't have a dermatologist in country until just, I think, about a year ago, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, we now have a, derma, a real dermatologist trained and in the capital city before we had um, Cuban dermatologists who would come on a two-year stint. And now we actually have a permanent person who can answer the consults. Teleradiology. I'm going to tell, show you the pictures that really explain it all. But the reason for teleradiology is clinicians with really minimal radiology training are reading x-rays in the remote areas and in district hospitals. And they really often request a second opinion from the radiologists that are in Haberone. So before we did teleradiology, what would happen is a clinician in a district hospital who wanted a, a read on an x-ray would put it on an ambulance that was going to the hospital next. They'd physically take the film. They'd put it in a stack like this. They'd have a piece of paper where they'd write the diagnosis. Eventually, it could take a couple months to get the opinion. And if it's an urgent patient, a couple months isn't very good. And by the time you get the answer, it's probably no longer needed at that point. So we've, uh, Ryan has actually been the one training the, we train the, the, tech, the techs who take the x-ray, how to take the photos. So this isn't another chore put on the clinicians. We have to be very careful about the workflow and not giving the clinicians something else to do because they see a really high volume of patients. So the technicians who tech, take the x-rays um, can actually take these pictures just fine, send them to the radiologist, get the second opinion, and they're the point of contact for the answer as well, and they can relay that to the clinician. And here's Dr. Akina and Dr. Sese, our two radiologists in Haberone, um, looking at the, the x-rays. Any questions on that before we go on to this last part? So now I'm going to talk a little bit about access to medical resources. So um, Ann Seymour can raise her hand. She's our biomedical librarian. Uh, here at Penn, and she's really done a lot of work with this program, um, getting it scaled up and getting our, um, our local biomedical librarian, Deneo, trained and helping with this project as well. Deneo was here at Penn for six months working in our biomedical library, and now she's back in Botswana working in the new UB, University of Botswana Library. And so we've done a couple projects. The first one, uh, was our first stab at getting medical information in the hands of the clinicians with cell phones. And we worked with the National Library of Medicine, the people who do PubMed, if you're familiar with that, um, to create an SMS text query system of PubMed. So the idea is you can have a very low level cell phone enter in uh, a text sort of code. So if you're looking for randomized control trial of asthma and pediatrics, there would be a way to type that in. They'd send it, and they would get the summary of abstracts back in text form. Uh, we also created a Java application, which was a lot easier to, to get through than just sending an SMS message. 
And then we also have our latest program, which is still running and actually scaling up pretty uh, broadly, which is the mobile learning project with the University of Botswana. And that's what I'm going to focus on. Here's our nurses using the SMS text query system of PubMed. We did a few trainings with them. But ultimately, it seemed like it wasn't very user friendly. It was a little clunky to use. They had to remember how to type in the queries. And so we haven't really relived that project yet. We're more focusing on this project, which is the mobile learning program with the University of Botswana residents. And this project has a couple different components. So the first one is access to medical literature. So on the phones, they're loaded with these things that you can see up there, Dynamed, Archimedes, a lot of the things that we have access to in the Penn School of Medicine. So they're e-books, journals, search engines for medical information. They're all loaded on these when the residents get them. There's another component where we've developed a program called doc to doc which is a group messaging system for physicians where the residents can can post messages, send cases, send videos to each other, or send them to their mentors for advice. So a lot of these residents are sent to remote clinics where they practice and they're in training, but there's very little mentorship or people they can ask about uh, difficult cases. So this program on their phone allows them to send cases to other residents or to mentors. And then the last part that we've developed for them is something called the Swin, Swin Fin Charitable Trust application. So Swinfin Charitable, Charitable, Charitable Trust is a telemedicine application which has been running I think since the 90s and it's run out of England and there was a big donation given by Lord and Lady Swinfin to set this up and the goal was to provide telemedicine to underserved areas anywhere in the world. It's an internet based application. Anyone anywhere in the world can go on it, submit a case, uh, It'll go to a case coordinator who will look at the case, decide what kind of specialist is needed, and she'll look in her database of specialists, send it out, and, and get an answer for, for the clinician. We've now submitted, we've now created a mobile application where the residents or whoever's using this can actually submit cases on their phones. So if there's no specialist in country or there's no one to send it to or no one knows the answer in country, they now have access to this network of global experts that they can send cases to. And all of the people on there that answer cases have experience in developing countries. So it's not like they're just sending it to, you know, the, the gynecologist down the street who has no idea what's available in the developing world. So it's actually, we're very excited about that. The HIPAA requirements for these programs? Right, so these are all, we develop the programs by the in-country specifications and regulations. So Botswana doesn't have HIPAA, but right now we don't have any patient identifiers in our program. Uh, it's all based on, you know, you can assign a number to the case, but right now there's no patient identifiers. We'll take the, we'll let the ministry take the lead on what they'll allow us to put in there. So what we'd like to do is put their medical record numbers in there and secure them in a way that it's okay. We want it to be secure, but in Botswana we don't have to live by those HIPAA standards. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna mention a, a program at the end of this talk where we do have to abide by HIPAA standards. And different countries are different in terms of where they want the data stored, you know, how they want the specifications done. In Egypt, they are very specific that they're patient data for that study we did had to be kept in the Ministry of Health on certain servers and they wanted complete access and didn't want anyone else to access it. Botswana, they don't, it's almost, they, they don't care that much on where the server is, whether it's in a cloud or whether it's physically kept in their Ministry of Health. So it's up to the country. Yes. All over the place. Okay. Yeah. So, um, Christian had a question about mm -hmm. that. Did it, did, did it go to some place and it's directed to the metro or even a regular metro? So, on the, on the phone? Yeah. So, 
certain groups of residents have certain mentors. So for example, we launched this in a city called Mahalape, which is sort of in the east coast of Botswana. Those residents are assigned to their mentor, who ordinarily would be the person they'd come find to ask questions, but this way they don't have to call them on the phone or physically find them, they can send it through the application. And the inspiration, at least a long time ago for me for that application was one of our uh, Botswana US physicians was telling us, the residents call me constantly with questions. Like he'll be in the middle of dinner, he'll be driving home, he'll be trying to sleep. And the, the phone, because they're very cell phone oriented, they'll be texting him and he'll be like, I wish there was a way to make this a formal process where I can answer them when I want to answer them. <laughs> Go ahead, Ryan. being random calls. So it's actually on, <laughs> it's in different places right now. As the Ministry of Health takes over this project, actually in the next few months, it's all going to be on government servers. Right. Yeah. And so um, those are the components of this, but those are great questions of the mobile learning. So here's our happy residents. You can see Anne down there doing our training, and Deneo, the UB librarian over in the corner. Um, but when we first introduced this concept, they were, they were very enthusiastic. It was a couple years ago, and not many people had, had smartphones. I think now maybe a few more do. Um, but they, one of our guys, we were just talking about this with um, John Holmes, who's an inf informatics expert and study, study design guy, um, about how people adapt technology at different paces. So there's these early adopters who they see something like this and they're all over it. They're sort of late adopters that they want to look at it a little bit more and maybe check it out before they really adopt it. And there's some people that will never adopt it. We had one guy who, um, they don't have really any books. So he would use this device and all the books on the device as his primary learning tool and go home and read on it like for three hours every night. <laughs> Uh, and the, <laughs> the screen was like this big. Now we have bigger screens, but you know that shows the motivation of some people and the desire for medical information. Um, one of the really interesting things about the program has been trying to get the locals to own this and to really have drive to spread and disseminate the information. And so um, they've created these public awareness posters. You can see there's the one on, in English and the one in Setswana. And these are actually up at the clinic, right? And so if people, people get consults, they're sort of familiar with what's going on, just to show them that this is actually an official program. A doctor's not pulling out a random phone just to take pictures of you. There's also been these specialty coordinator training sessions. So each, each specialty has a coordinator that is the person that coordinates everyone else and makes sure the program's running. And they would create these training sessions where they teach people how to take the photos, how to submit the cases, but they would also tag onto those some educational workshops. So there was extra bonus on, uh, on doing these uh, workshops. Not only would they learn how to do telemedicine, but they would share information. This one was about, I think one of the pictures Ryan has, there's like a big tooth picture. I don't know much about dentistry, but they were talking about dental problems and sharing stories and really getting to know each other. So it's been a great networking thing for them too. So moving beyond, um, we're scaling up and we just got word a couple weeks ago that UB School of Medicine is going to scale this up to all of their medical, third and fourth year medical students and residents who are 
um, training in remote areas. So 120 new devices are being purchased, and this is really going to be scaled up. And the, that shows that they appreciate the fact that their students and residents need access to mentoring and educational resources. We also had Wharton go down a couple weeks ago. They're doing a cost-benefit analysis on this project because it's, it's been successful in Botswana and it's going to be scaled up in Botswana. But we want to show that it's actually helping the government with cost savings so that when we go to other countries to do similar work, we can show that this is actually helpful not only for the patients but also for the governments that provide the care. Any questions on that's Africa. I'm done with the Africa. We'll come back if anyone has any questions. Yes. Yeah. Are there So it's it's just those three components right now. We lump them into M learning, but we have so many ideas on other things we can add, like lectures. Um, pushing lectures out to them that maybe their program coordinators want them to see. Um, lots of other learning tools that we would like to have that we just haven't done yet. So, is it a module of learning or is it a course? So, the only thing we have right now on, on mobile learning is just the educational resources, so basically books, looking up information, the mentoring, sending things to the mentors or sending things to other global experts. But we hope that we'll expand in that way, Ryan. The what? Let me give, I'm going to give Ryan a, why don't you come sit up here, because I have a microphone right here, but for the taping purses. Because they're taping it, you need a mic. Oh, sorry. Um, do you have difficulties in, in, in what respect, the technology, the uptake, the... Um, okay, so I'll touch upon the, the technology part first. So when we first, does this work? Can you yep. guys hear me okay? Um, when we first started, these, these studies were, um, the, the technology supporting them was proprietary software supported outside of the country uh, by a group called Click Diagnostics, um, specifically. And the difficulties we ran into with that when I was on the ground is, um, one, as proprietary software, they're the only ones who can support it, right, and who, who developed it. Um, so whenever we ran into problems, sorry. Okay. So whenever we ran into problems and experienced bugs, and believe me, no matter what technology you use, you will run into bugs and problems once you, once you implement it in the field. Uh, we always had to turn to them who were based um, in another time zone. Um, and, and it was very difficult uh, for them to, to support us in terms of the IT involved without having people on the ground who can actually experience. We were taking pictures of the phones and the errors and stuff like that. Uh, and there's just such a big disconnect there. Um, so now with, this, with the scale up with the ministry, we're converting to use a system that's 100% using open source technologies, combinations of different open source technologies, all Android phones, um, open source databases, open source data collection tools, et cetera. And the stipulation is it needs to be supported by a local IT group, so an IT company that is based and, and operates in Botswana. Um, and, and we're hoping that'll solve a lot of the difficulties we experienced from, from the technology um, side early on. Um, what else <laughs> did you ask in terms of like relationships and just like uh, we've run into, um, I, I, I think Challenges associated with like politics and bureaucracy and stuff like that is just completely unavoidable, I've, I've come to realize. Um, we run into issues with people at the ministry, uh, people for, for reasons I still, I still don't quite understand, don't, don't like our projects and don't want it to succeed. Um, I, it's, it's, it, it's been an eye-opening for me actually to have to deal with these types of challenges, but uh, just random personality and polit political things. Um, some people at the ministry, they, they'll get very upset that we didn't, um, 
uh, present to them on a separate occasion about this one thing, we're, whereas we were completely unaware of it. So how, you need to have a very firm grasp of, of who you need to have your uh, project succeed um, and make sure you address all of their needs uh, that could exist. And don't assume for a second that you know all the, all the needs and all the things that they might want. You should approach all of them um, personally. Um, other challenges, oh, uh, implementing with technology in the fields, giving people smartphones who've never used them before, uh, especially spread out around the country. We've had several phones that um, have been dropped uh, just on the floor in water and sanitization liquids. Uh, we've had phones that have been stolen, two phones have been stolen. One was stolen by a patient in a ward, <laughs> took the phone and ran out of the ward. <laughs> I, <laughs> I guess he wasn't that sick. But, um, these, these are all things that you, know, we, we, you need to be aware of. So now we have new um, policies whenever we implement train people with phones. We also give them carrying cases and protective cases. Part of the training sessions now are just how to take care of a smartphone as opposed to just kind of giving them, just like things that we kind of take for granted. Uh, people have never held and used smartphones before. So we're incorporating these things into the trainings. Uh, now that we're using Android phones, we're using this really great software called Lookout Security, which if you lose the phone, you can log on to a computer with your Lookout account and it'll show where your phone is on a Google map using the GPS from the phone. So we can go if find you... that patient. <laughs> exactly. So <laughs> someone, if someone back. runs off with it, <laughs> even if you have the GPS turned off on the phone, it'll, it'll still work, which is great. And then similarly, some people, one of the doctors lost the phone somewhere in his car for like weeks. And so there's a that Lookout also has a really great um, thing where you can, you can log on, have your phone screen, so, scream. So even if it's turned off or if a silent mode is on, it'll start ringing and flashing. And so it's like little things like this, um, how to, how to uh, these are challenges that you don't expect uh, going into it, but there are, there, are, there are many there. And we're still experiencing some. Yeah. Anne? <laughs> I, I, I had to forget the, about I, I, I didn't want to bring this up. I had the pleasure of pulling an all-nighter with Ann Seymour setting up all these devices once. What time we finish? At like 3 a.m. or something? The night before an implementation. Yeah, yeah, multiple in a row. That's another thing. Um, you, you really can't uh, assume anything will work in the country, in, in, in some of the countries that you work in. So um, I think before that time, we had set up the phones in the States and then brought them there. This time, we decided to set them up in the country, and we just ran into a million problems. And the internet wasn't strong enough to download all the content, and serial numbers, things were going wrong. So um, yeah, I think, I think just having a very firm grasp of, of every single task that needs to be done and, and trying to minimize the amount um, of risk with, with those setups um, is important. Yeah. Uh, but one's a little unique. Yeah. I don't know if you want to touch upon it. In terms of the, there's not much of a community right. healthcare worker force. Um, so it's, yeah, there's definitely countries that really utilize community health workers and those that don't. Uh, Botswana really hasn't, and there have been initiatives to get them to use them, and it just hasn't worked. They have this pyramidal scheme of, of, the, of the healthcare system where they do have health posts, but all those health posts, which are really rural, are run by nurses at the minimal. But really populated countries, so India, Bangladesh, Kenya, places that just have so many people, um, community health workers are really effective to just reach those people. Um, and there's a whole other group of mHealth applications and ways to do mobile health in, pay, in countries where they have community health workers. This has really been challenging because there's not a lot of mHealth activity in countries that don't utilize community health yeah. workers. Right, yeah. exactly. And, and, and the biggest problem in Botswana is people don't come, don't go to the healthcare facilities until they're so sick that they can't work anymore. One of the most fascinating cases I saw in the oral medicine project was this, this guy who had this little, it started off as little, uh, I guess it was a pimple at first on his lip, and it became the size of an American football. 
thrown out to here. He only went to the healthcare facility because he couldn't see over it anymore to work in the field. That was that was why. Awful. It's a very but it you know it, it, it causes it's, it's this very unique problem where conditions are so advanced out there by the time they actually um, see right. it as it's much more difficult to treat. Right. And we are actually, we're applying for a larger um, grant through USAID, where one of the aspects of the grant is to engage the community and really understand why people do certain things, why people don't utilize the health system, why they prefer to go to a, a local healer, why they yeah. may prefer community health workers. I think it might help us understand that mentality a little better. Because even if we do implement telemedicine systems, if the patients aren't going in, then we have a problem. Yeah, I would say that's just one other issue and challenge in Botswana is there is a, a, a very deep-seated cultural belief in like traditional uh, medicine there, uh, which is, is kind of difficult to overcome at times, yeah. Yep. Right. <laughs> like homegrown docs, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's been a, yeah. Sixties, 60s, 66, yeah. Yeah. So, okay. I just have one last little part of this talk, and I like to talk about this because the way this project came about was us learning about our projects in Africa and bringing the concept back to the U.S., which isn't usually the way things flow. We usually try and take our technology and impose them on other people in developing countries. But our mobile telemedicine worked well. Uh, we decided to use it in the U.S. And I just have a few slides. So together with the American Academy of Dermatology, our group at Penn, has created an application called Access Derm, which is actually now, as of last week, on the iPhone store and the Android market. So we're very happy. Mm -hmm. You can always download it and, and um, just look at it if you'd like. <laughs> you, can't send case, you can't send cases of your acne for free. You actually have to be you know, linked into a dermatologist. But um, the reason we developed this was to provide care to the U.S. underserved populations. And so Access Derm has been set up in the pilot phase in 26 clinics around the U.S., um, linking free and federally funded health centers to local dermatology groups. So those clinics were sending those groups dermatology cases, and we showed that it worked. And now we have this uh, much more sophisticated um, Access Derm program, which is on um, all of these devices, which will allow you to use your own personal phone to send us dermatology consults. So right now it's still very constrained and small because we want to make sure that it works exactly like we want it to work before we open the floodgates because we know as soon as it does work, all of those clinics that don't have access to dermatology services are going to want to come in and, and find a dermatologist to, to join up with. Um, so, for example, at Penn, we're connected to the LAC Center, which is the HIV uh, clinic downtown for uninsured patients, and the SARE Federally Quali Qualified Health Center, which is in West Philadelphia. Before we started this project, their patients really didn't have anywhere to go if they had a skin condition. The clinicians were just doing their best to manage them on their own, which is similar to our Philadelphia City Health Clinics. There's 10 of them around the city. Those clinics are linked to a safety net hospital. So Penn has Health Center 3 and 4. Um, other uh, hospitals like Temple has a couple clinics associated with them. So if there's someone really sick at one of those city health clinics, they can come to the hospital that they're linked with for, for free or the city will pay for it or whatever. Well, Penn has dermatology, Temple doesn't. So the people that go to Health Center 10 don't have any dermatology because the hospital they're linked to doesn't have a dermatologist. And so there's a lot of need. You, you'd, be un, you'd, you'd really um, be shocked at how many patients in our healthcare system can get basic health care but really can't get specialty health care. And so the way this works is we've created a similar system 
It's completely HIPAA compliant, which has been a challenge because we're allowing people to use their own personal phones. You can use the web. So this is the website or you can use the mobile device, or you can use a blend of the two. So if you start a case on your phone, you start taking the pictures and enter the information, but you don't have time to finish, you can submit it and finish it on the website. It's all stored in the cloud, so everything is pulled down from the cloud and always completely synced between the web and the, the phone applications. Um, so we, as, as a dermatologist, when I get a case, I'll log on to the web because that's the biggest screen that I have to look at the case, but I could use a, a, an iPad if I wanted to. And the way it works is the clinics in your neighborhood that are in this system are officially linked to you. So we have Sarah and Lax linked to our Penn dermatologist. And when they send a case, we get an email that says there's a case. We log on, whoever grabs the case first gets to answer the case. And we've even set up the flow so that our residents can answer the case, send it to the derma us as attending dermatologists to review their answer and send it on so we can incorporate training into it as well. Um, and it's really been exciting to have our technology we developed in Botswana come back here. Um, this is what it looks like. It's all uh, logged in. None of the photos that you take within the application are actually stored on your phone. So if you lose your phone, there's no patient pictures. They're actually stored on the cloud. You go to the little dashboard here as a primary care doctor, you can create a new case. When the case is answered, you get this little push notification that tells you how many answered cases you have. Um, pending response means you're still waiting for the response from the dermatologist. Um, drafts is if you save it but it's not done, uh, you can go back in the phone and finish it or go on the web and finish it. And then case history, so you always have access to look at these cases um, that are completed. And also the design that I, I like is that all the primary care docs, for example, at SARE Clinic can see each other's consults. So a lot of times patients aren't going to come back to the same provider at a small clinic like that, but they may need access to the, to the answer. They can see it if it's one of their colleagues' um, cases as well. And then you just kind of toggle through when you, when you create a new case and enter the information and then take the photos and submit the case. And we designed it so that it was simple enough that someone could open the application and really get through it with no training. It's a little bit more complicated um, on the administration side. So each clinic has someone that is the administrator and sets up everyone with usernames and passwords. That's a little bit more complicated, but just sending a case is really easy. And this is my baby. <laughs> I should start putting that idea in my PowerPoint. Any questions uh, at all? We've got a few minutes if anyone has any. Yep. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the develop, developing countries have just focused so much on mobile technology, whereas we and the clinic can get on the computer. There's a computer in every patient room. So there hasn't been that stressed need to focus on mobile technology, but it's really with the newer generation <clears throat> students and residents, it's going to be more of a focus. All right. Well, thanks for coming. Oh, you have a question? Yeah. <laughs> oh, we've been back and forth with them a little bit um, about potentially collaborating in Malawi, and I, their their main IT guy, this guy Isaac uh, yeah. Holman, yeah, he's a really nice, bright guy. I've, ch I've been to a few conferences with him, and we've nerded out about these things a few times. They're, they're really great, Malawi. Right. Yep, Tony. Yeah, I think uh, the U.S. medical system is very technology-driven. Is there any? Yeah, we haven't done that because the primary reason for developing it was the AAD's mission for volunteerism. But what we'd really like to do is utilize our experience with this application to get teledermatology reimbursed. It's a huge issue right now. Um, live video teledermatology is reimbursed nationwide, but store and forward where you send pictures 
is only reimbursed in like three states. California is one of them, Georgia, I think. And so we want to show that Medicaid could use this to reimburse. Um, you know, they don't pay very much, but this takes us, it could take us two minutes to answer a case like this. And a dermatologist probably wouldn't mind getting reimbursed for a lower rate if it was this way. And so that's what we'd really like to get accomplished. All right, great, thanks for coming.